and welcome to our first edition of the Coconut Talanoa series. First up, we have Aingangale Fili, Kefuleae, and welcome Fili. So today is, is basically just an open Talanoa about lockdown, the current state in New Zealand, and how our young people have been dealing with it. How are you feeling? I'm good. Oh, as good as any of us are during this lockdown. Thank you for agreeing to have this Talano with me. I think a lot of the times no one asks, are you? Like, how, mm -hmm. how are they feeling? I yeah. think it's like, oh, they're fine. And a lot of the times it's like the forgotten population of New Zealand. It's like young Pasifika and Māori um, with like young brown kids using like humour to, to make sense of the struggles of this these past few weeks I guess my first question has been is do you feel like this lockdown is an experience that everyone is feeling equally no definitely not um I think in terms of this lockdown comparing it to the last lockdown as well there's a lot of inequalities that were highlighted last year that have continued to come on to this lockdown and the lockdowns this year and in many ways have not been addressed um efficiently or enough especially when i look at the media the way the media treats um south auckland treats pacifica treats those with less privilege and who are more vulnerable um really differently to those who have more privilege and have gotten away with a lot more during this lockdown um and when it comes to systemic issues that exist outside of lockdown of course it doesn't just stop once we go into lockdown it continues and it all adds up and it kind of compounds into this really weird state where you're looking around and you don't really realize what's happening until suddenly you have to face one of those situations yourself. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that if anything, lockdowns are really a, a time to magnify all the inequalities that exist within our communities. And I think um, I could see that conversation coming alive online specifically like on twitter and on instagram around the the way the media has presented this lockdown right mm -hmm. um and how you know when the first was it was the first case of the pakeha man from north shore right mm -hmm. um where it was like that first patient that was told out to the media that this person has um the coronavirus and that you know this might mean lockdown and these were the places he has been and this is where the community outbreak is and i think like the first um reaction kind of from media was okay let's cut this guy some slack mm -hmm. and there was a gofundme that was created for him or um people were wanting to send him um like flowers and and gifts for being i guess someone in the eye of the media but yet that wasn't the same energy that was given when there was a case in South Auckland. Um, do you have any thoughts around this? It's really weird being in the lockdown and looking at the media because being from South Auckland, everyone knows the way we're treated by the media. So it's nothing new and it's nothing um, surprising really, which is almost more disappointing than if it was surprising. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's really difficult for a community like us to be trying to mobilize and trying to get our people um, as safely away from COVID as we can, but also have the media on our backs and blaming us for things which they are not holding other people account to, especially in cases where we saw with um, the Salmon Church, it was a gathering that was before we went into lockdown, but people were still giving them slack and were still blaming them for things which were beyond their control. Um, and when it comes to questions of, you know, how does South Auckland have so many cases and do they deserve to be kind of demonized in the media for the fact that we have so many cases. There's a lot of things that aren't taken into account. Um, a lot of nuances like, okay, but you're not really realizing that we have so many essential workers. We have people with so much high contact jobs and the fact that healthcare isn't as good in our areas as it is in other areas. And so when you're not taking into account all of these things, it's kind of watering down how hard it is for us. And the fact that you can't really compare us the same to other people who have more privileges and who have um, more money and more power than we do to kind of get a better hold on the current situation. And so it's really sad to see. Um, but on the flip side, I know that there's a lot of people out here who are doing so much great work who are kind of 
um, in this mentality of, yeah, that's what the media says, but you know, we still have work to do and we're still going to do the work regardless. Yeah, 100%. I think there's so many like powerful community stories that aren't really highlighted. Mm. Um, and like you said, the, the resilient stories of, um, I think I saw on TikTok, there was like an auntie at one of the like Pacific vaccine drives who was singing um crazy have you seen that yeah. um and i just i just loved seeing that and also all the tiktoks of the security guard at pack and save mm. um who's like telling everyone to keep calm and to be happy and he sings for people in line so that they're like in a good mood before they go into the shop and i just think that there's so many of those stories as well, right? That aren't being told, but they're out there. And I guess as specific people who live within our communities, we're lucky enough to see it. Mm. And it's yeah, it's just a shame that the rest of New Zealand don't don't see what is happening so positively within mm. Pacifica communities and the vaccine drives that like they had like an MMT one mm. where like everyone came with their flags. Um, they, they're like starting to do the Tuvaluan ones and the smaller Pacific Island communities this week. Um, and that's like brings me a lot of hope. And I, I, I really wish more people and more media shine attention on that because that's those are amazing feats that our people are doing. Mm. Definitely. And I think it's so funny because it's also interesting to see a lot of other areas like have you seen the photos of Takapuna and the people who are like out on the beaches and people in all these different areas that are in South Auckland who are breaking lockdown but yeah. there's like nothing from the media about any of that and so it's interesting to see that even when there's things that we're doing that are right it's not highlighted or when there's things that people are doing that are wrong it's not highlighted either only the stuff that we're doing that's wrong is highlighted um but yeah yeah, 100%. And even just the way that um, the Wanaka couple was reported on um, and how much grace, yeah, mm. and how much grace that they were given um, compared to, just like you said, like villainizing people from South Auckland. And I really mm. feel for the, like the mom of, of one of the um, patients that escaped. Yeah. And, you know, she got on the hood and she was apologizing and um, just showing that she knew what was wrong and like just the fact that she like put aside her pride and humbled herself to say sorry. Mm. But yet there was a couple who just went to their holiday home and everyone was yeah. the media were like, oh, we should feel sorry for them because, you know, they, they, they don't want their names out there. Yeah. And then funny enough, like their mom, one of the couple's mom. Um, who was a judge kind of came out and said to the media like no you're not allowed to ask us any questions and it was just like a massive difference in response just between those two situations but um, of course like you said the response from the media even though one mother kind of approached it from a more um, place of humility I feel 100%. still got villainized more for what she did than what the couple did and so man I feel like it's so funny when we're in lockdown and people talk about it, um, but don't really realize that it's definitely an issue that comes from history, like mm. decades of this happening and happening and happening again. So when it comes to something like COVID, of course, it's going to be like our communities are just we're the ones that are going to get the, oh my gosh, the backlash for all of it. There's a lot to like, yeah, unpack and, and also just to sit with the realization of how yeah, situations like this when society's put under pressure really magnifies those inequalities that already yeah. historically and systemically, like you said, a big part of this is also studying in, if for a lot of our like Pacifica students, it, it's mm -hmm. studying in lockdown is really hard for us. Like it's not the same as like people who are studying in like a household of like a handful who, you know, mm. have like a desk space and like an area to to be free to like study and to have mm. access to like all these resources where, you know, a lot of our, our Pacifica households, because we're such a community-based 
you know, culture, we have heaps of people in our households and, yeah. you know, we have like heaps of siblings and cousins who come, you know, and, and live with us and it's not the same. And I think that's something that I always complain to like my lecturers about or mm-hmm. to people I have online classes with. It's, I really don't think that students and, and like us who are studying from home should be forced to turn on our cameras Mm. because that's a big thing for for some like lessons right it's like you have to turn on your camera to to study and to be in the class but what about those that you know have their cousins like studying in the same room or their siblings are also trying to get their homework done you shouldn't have to be forced to show people your private life Mm. and I think those things aren't taken into account as well Definitely. There's so many little things that people don't realize um, actually do matter because there's a lot of cultural differences and those are just one of them. I mean, even when people kind of don't understand that we have essential workers in our homes, that we have, um, a lot of us don't have our own rooms. And so it's like me kind of showing you my house feels like an almost invasion of my privacy and kind of showing you more about myself that I don't want you to know type thing. Um, And especially when a lot of our students have to share the same laptop with their siblings and their cousins and everyone that's there. I know that schools are giving out, um, which is great, they're giving out laptops now, but now they have like $100 bonds on them that Mm -hmm. families have to pay. And it's like, well, it is really difficult to have all of these different problems coming at the same time. It kind of makes the youth feel like they don't know what to focus on and it's harder to focus on school. But um, as we, been talking about it's all about taking care of their mental health and making sure that they have the support that they need last year you spoke a little bit about those who had to um leave school to to find jobs during you know the hardship of covid um do you see that also happening this this time around in this lockdown i think it is a really big possibility um Mm -hmm. because of the amount of cases that we've had here um, and because of the unsurety around whether we want our elders to be going back to work and to be in such high contact jobs, um, a lot of people don't have the privilege of not choosing to work. And unfortunately, a lot of those people happen to be our teenagers who are in school. Um, and so I see it being definitely continuous. And it almost feels like as long as we have COVID and the approach of our bus school communities aren't community led um, and aren't centered around specific values and culture it almost feels like these problems that we are facing will continue as long as COVID is here um, it won't just cut off at one year and it won't, definitely won't cut off at the end of this lockdown um, and so for me and for the people that I've been talking to and working with um, we've kind of been trying to find ways to support the cohorts who are in high school Um, once this lockdown is and during this lockdown and kind of give them the space that they need to talk about these things and kind of just let it all out because it feels heavy it feels really heavy Um, especially when some of them are kind of at the end of the year and they've had these plans about what they want to do but now lockdowns kind of changed everything Um, and that's also comes back to what we were talking about people not experiencing lockdown the same way Um, because I found that it's so jarring seeing um, being from South Auckland and you know when I was in a Lotus South school last year and even now like working with Lotus South school students even without out of everyone in our community how easily lockdown can change someone's life um, and I don't think that's the same for or not to the same degree for a lot of other people in New Zealand um, changes it financially changes the trajectory changes um, their future and their plans and when you see how drastically those changes are met um, and how drastically it changes people's lives, it's kind of funny to look at the media and have them say, like you say, team of 5 million, because um, it always feels like they're leaving a lot of people behind yeah. and they kind of pretend like we're all, like you say, on an equal playing field when we're not. Yeah, mm. oh, that's so powerful. And I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I think that, a lot of the the vulnerable people within these lockdowns are like our young Pacific people. Mm. And because we have so much like 
love for our elders and, and our parents and those who have to go to work and, you know, have to struggle during these times, like, of course, we're going to put ourselves last and put them first. It isn't the same sacrifices that, like, say, like, a Pakeha youth have had, had to mm-hmm. make. You know, I acknowledge that there are, like, Pakeha youth that have made sacrifices too, but mm-hmm. just statistically, the way that um, our stats on, you know, essential workers being Pacific Islanders, you know, those in South Auckland, which is the the bridge for the world to get to New Zealand, mm-hmm. um, a Pacific Islanders, you know, we can see in the numbers that it, it is our young brown youth that are at the forefront of having to give up something or having to sacrifice mm-hmm. studies or sacrifice something that they wanted to do to be able to provide for their families. Yeah, it's definitely bittersweet. I mean, of course, we're not sob stories. We're not um, only tragedy and heartache and all these things. Like there's so much happiness and joy that exists in our communities. But I've found that a lot of the times that happiness and joy is intertwined with that pain. But it doesn't excuse um, a lot of the things that we face that causes it. Often, um, when I talked about a lot of the things that happened in the last lockdown, um, something that I found is that a lot of adults couldn't understand how it was any different to how a lot of people worked in, in jobs when they were in high school. And I was thinking about it and I was kind of like, I think the difference is COVID. <laughs> I mean, working in a high contact job during a pandemic while you're in high school is really different to working a high contact job any other time. Before COVID, it was the norm. I mean, it's not something new for Pacifica people to drop out and work for their families. But I think now that we're experiencing COVID, it does mean that we're putting a lot more at risk by doing these things, not just in terms of education, but I mean, in terms of health. Um, and again, relating back to the reasons why we ended up with more COVID cases. Um, because, you know, last lockdown, we were also the most tested. We had the highest rates of testing as well. And we had the highest rates of people who were kind of asking these questions to their doctors as well. So it was like, we were putting in the work and it just so happens that this time around, we weren't lucky with the COVID variant. I was having a lot of conversations about the RSE scheme mm-hmm. um, before lock- this was before lockdown. Um, about how last year a lot of our RSE workers were facing abuse from employers during lockdown and recently before lockdown um, New Zealand brought back RSE workers you know to pick our fruit and to um, fill in that labour gap and now that we're in lockdown I think it's really interesting to see these industries who pretty much the backbone of the industry is Pacifica workers yeah. Um, also not acknowledge that at all when it comes to these conversations like you say about kickstarting the economy and about um, how we're working down to level three and the next levels um, and I think that that's really dangerous because it's almost like hiding the exploitation that allows us to continue to live in a covered world um, and it's almost like these people that you're exploiting are also the ones who are going to face the harshest consequences and who are currently facing the harshest consequences um in COVID numbers and oh my gosh all of it just feels really mm. yeah no that is a really important point and I think something that we all need to be reminded of when we hear these you know headlines of kickstarting the economy or you know keeping everything going it's like it's not the CEOs and the big bosses who are out in the fields and the supermarkets and the delivery Mm. trucks it it's the working class people. And a lot of the times, yeah, their jobs are thankless and we're not giving them their fl- the flowers that they deserve. And also like just acknowledging the anxiety that they would have just going back to work yeah. and, and validating those feelings of like, this really sucks. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the times we're kind of pushed toxic positivity, like, you should be happy you have a job yeah. you should be grateful you're in New Zealand you should be like this you should be that but I think we can be grateful and we can be happy people yeah. with also validating our feelings of this is unfair this mm-hmm. sucks I wish I wasn't doing this I wish we weren't in a global mm-hmm. pandemic because both feelings can be valid at the same time mm-hmm. um, but I definitely think it, it can be really harmful to just like 
tell our young people, and even our older people too, even our elders who are going back to work, like you should just be grateful you have a job. Um, you know, first generation migrants, like from our Pacifica families, mm -hmm. um, of course, wanting us like younger generations to be grateful and to like acknowledge that we do hold some privileges. Mm -hmm. and, but those two truths can exist at once. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. like um, speaking out about injustice and speaking out about how this lockdown and in this COVID situation and the way New Zealand has addressed it has been unfair. The way media have presented the news has been unfair. Mm -hmm. Can be sometimes misconstrued as, oh, maybe they're not grateful for being in New Zealand. Like, no, that that those aren't the mm -hmm. facts. And I think yeah. that's such a false narrative that, you know, we're fali or like mm -hmm. we're, you know, fiapoko or uh, mm -hmm. like that, that's not the driving factor of a lot of these young people um, in our generation who are speaking out, a lot of their their anger and like these feelings of we deserve better comes from a place of love because we do deserve better. When we're reported on mm -hmm. like we're villains and when, you know, the oh. economy relies on us and our workers are exploited, we do have a right to speak up and demand better. Exactly. I mean, when we talk about this gratitude that we should have, um, for being in New Zealand, what comes to mind is, well, shouldn't that be reciprocated? Shouldn't mm -hmm. we feel like New Zealand feels grateful to have us and what we're doing in the community? Because of everything that's happening, it doesn't feel like they're grateful for yeah. the work that we do and for um, our essential workers, for all these things we're doing in the community. Their gratitude is not felt. And because it's not felt, it's literally costing us so much more than just the lives that are being lost so much more in terms of social progress. And so it's like, Yes, be grateful, but also learn to be appreciated. <laughs> oh, we should be appreciated, that's the same. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining um, me today. If you ever need any like support, let us know and we can post it and like ask everyone to help, give a helping hand so that our students are really supported during this time.